Hello beautiful people, welcome to Mimsy Vids. I am Marwa, aka Mimsy, and today I'm talking about something quite serious. It's the grooming gangs that have basically been happening in the UK. So I basically wanted to break down the issues around grooming gangs, the issues around the patterns, which is the main controversy, which I'll explain in a second. But basically, for anyone that doesn't know what the grooming gangs are, these have been an organized group of men that have basically been gang raping young girls as young as 11 years old. Girls were groomed, trafficked, abused, raped, and some were passed around to be sexually assaulted again and again. The most recent convictions have been in Huddersfield, which is in the north north of England. Actually, most of them are kind of that sort of area. Places like, so Newcastle, Halifax, Peterborough, Rotherham, Derby, Banbury, Oxford. This has been happening for so many years. I mean, there are girls in their kind of 30s now that are talking about how it happened to them when they were 11 and 12. So it's been happening for ages and it's happened to so many girls. In Rotherham, it was 1,500 girls that they're aware of, of course, because these crimes are, there's so much manipulation involved. The manipulation happens often with kind of drugs and alcohol. So providing them with drugs, with alcohol, you know, making them dependent on the drugs and alcohol, telling them that if they were to do anything, they would be threatened by them abusing their mothers or whatever they need to do basically to entrap these women. And the controversy around these things that have happened is because there is a pattern. The majority are Muslim men of Pakistani background and the majority of victims, their background is majority white girls, white English girls. Obviously in every country there are criminals and there are paedophiles and there are horrible things happening in the world but what we should look for are patterns you know are patterns in behaviors of why things are happening so that we can try and prevent things from happening why is it that this particular act has a pattern obviously that would raise alarm bells and to be honest with you the way that muslims are reacting to this point of the fact that well the majority are muslim what does that mean a lot of them have this kind of defensive mechanism of being like oh well actually the majority of paedophiles and the majority of sexual offenders in the UK are actually white men. Only 24% of uh, the uh, child sex ex exploitation uh, uh, suspects and perpetrators were Asian. So whilst I'm not trying to defend anyone uh, from any reprehensible act, it's very important we, we approach this with a, with a scientific method taking into account. You know, it becomes this whole kind of deflection of, no, 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 it's nothing to do with Islam, it's nothing to do with this, it's nothing to do with that. I actually find that answer so frustrating, t the total deflection of saying, well, white men are the majority. Well, obviously white men are the majority. White people are the majority in this country. If we're talking about percentages, you know, Pakistani, so just Pakistani, because obviously there actually are other people involved. So I think that it was mainly Pakistani and then the second majority was Bangladeshi, which obviously is another Asian background. Uh, but there were also Kurds, Turkish people, there was Indian as well. But, but even actually, if you exclude Pakistani, the majority are still kind of Muslim backgrounds, you know, Iraqi, Kurdish, Turkish, they're still actually Islamic backgrounds. Majority of them, there are Sikh, there is a minority of other races and other backgrounds, but overwhelmingly the majority is Asian and Muslim. And if you look at the population, you know, 1.6% of the UK population is Pakistani. And these crimes are committed by, let's say, 70 to 80% of that small population, that's where you see the disproportion. I don't understand how that can't be significant. Of course that's significant. And it's not about, you know, racism. It's not about Islamophobia. It's just facts. This is happening. We need to know why. However, I do want to state clearly before I go into more detail that I know overall Islam does not condone these actions. But the grooming gang issue is a multi-dimensional problem. It's not just one thing. Now, the majority of Pakistanis are actually in those regions, so in the northern regions of England, and the majority of these Pakistanis are from a particular place actually, because there was an area in Pakistan, which on the in the Kashmiri region of Pakistan, called Mirpur basically, the government of Pakistan had said to the government of England, you guys need some labourers in your northern regions, uh, we need to build a dam so you can take thousands of these guys and they're basically cheap labor for you and also we have space to build a dam 
in the place where they used to live. So England had an influx of, of these guys come over. But what we need to know actually about where they've just come from is Mirpur was a village and it is a very old school, traditional, cultured way of thinking and this and this sort of village mentality includes you know very kind of tribal mentalities and you know a caste system and essentially an aspect of racism um which kind of comes from that mentality and it can easily derive I, i'd put it that way maybe can easily derive from that mentality so the issues i want to look at here are the issues of culture of race of integration of of islam you know all these kind of aspects together so the way that women are viewed overall culturally and from the religious perspective i think is a massive thing that needs to be looked at here so so culturally, obviously, the woman is, you know, your wife, subservient, submissive, um, would kind of stay at home, cook and clean. And within Islam, men are also superior to women. So it almost maintains that kind of cultural viewpoint. You know, mams can only be men. A woman's testimony is half that of a man. Women will receive half that of a man's inheritance. Islam obviously talks about disciplining women, how the men discipline their wives. And, and you know, there are various other examples, but the point is there is a power a difference which I think is almost kind of fuel to the fire you know if you've got this old school cultural viewpoint but also there are things in the religion they just go hand in hand and then it's just this perspective of men are powerful and women should be subservient to the men and I do think that's an important point because a lot of these men will have the viewpoint that they have this power over women they have this ability over women that they are superior but the point is that mentality almost helps their perverse way of understanding things. But also the best kind of women, what they're taught religiously and culturally, are the sorts of women that cover themselves, not showing their attractiveness. So not having their attraction out for anyone to see. And the word purity is often used as well. You know, if a girl's pure, and it, and it kind of relates to this idea of virginity, you know, if a girl's a virgin, she is the best of the best. You know, a virgin, modest, shy. The prophet talks about how it's better for you to marry a virgin girl so that you can play with her. You know, a virgin is better to marry and be with. You know, that kind of pure aspect is always going to be right at the top of the hierarchy. Even when you go to heaven, a man would get two virgin girls to sleep with uh, as wives. Uh, you know, beautiful eyes, white skin, and they're gonna be virgins. And when you have sex with them, they become virgins again. And for martyrs, you know, you get 72 virgins in heaven. You know, the, the virgin thing is emphasized so much. Like virgin girls, the best girl is the, you know, as I said in this kind of hierarchical thing, is the best of statuses you can be. So then putting that against kind of Western culture where you don't necessarily need to be married to a person to have sex you can have sex with multiple partners you know you, you have different relationships there's obviously way more fluidity when it comes to sex it's such a completely different perspective on the idea of sex by the way a lot of these girls were virgins when they were abused um, and when they were taken you know because they're so young you know as young as 11 years old um, and they often kind of got those girls that young so that they could manipulate them. So it's not about the particular girl, it's about the race that they are and the culture that they come from. There's actually a hadith that I thought of, it's in Bukhari and Muslim, and basically um, the Prophet and his companions were going to take these slave women to be ransomed. It's acceptable within Islam to have these slave women, you know, to sleep with them if the, you're not married to them and, and for you to essentially possess them. You know, God talks about the slave women as what your right hand possesses. So they were planning to ransom these particular women uh, and they were kind of on their way to ransom them and the companions were really really wanting to sleep with them they really couldn't hold themselves back they were like we just want to sleep with them but then if we impregnate them then we'll be responsible for them because the Prophet Muhammad had said, you know, if you impregnate them, you need to be responsible for that kid and the slave should stay with you after that until you die. So these men were like, oh, you know, we haven't seen our wives in a while. We just want to sleep with them, but we don't want to be responsible basically. So they actually asked the Prophet, you know, if we have sex, but then we kind of do the pull out method basically, then hopefully they won't be pregnant and then we don't have to be responsible and then we can still ransom them. We just want to make sure that they don't get pregnant. And the Prophet 
basically said, look, if they get pregnant, they get pregnant. You know, what can you do? And there's obviously so many things wrong with that situation. But the main thing is the, the treatment of those women. You know, the virgin, pure, Muslim, free woman at the top of this hierarchy would essentially be covered with these men that aren't related to her, maybe even behind a screen uh, with a partition w w with these men. A lot of Muslims say that the, the believing women need to be actually segregated from men. So if they were at the top of this hierarchy and they were free Muslim women, they perhaps wouldn't have that same interaction as these slave women who are perhaps right at the bottom. So there is this Islamic concept of women and of kind of women being at different levels. It's okay to do that to the slave women, but it wouldn't be okay to do that to a pure, free, hijabi covered Muslim girl. But then also this kind of tribal cultural aspect definitely comes into play. So it's kind of a blend of the two. So they will see the purest and you know the top of the hierarchy as Muslim, but also from their own caste and their own village and very often their own family. There's a huge amount of cousin marriages in this region. And obviously the majority of these girls that are being abused are white English girls. The comparison of the cultures is very key here in understanding kind of how their mentalities work. Because obviously if they're coming from this mentality of this is the hierarchy and this is a pure person, a pure girl, and somehow in their own disgusting minds makes them feel like because they don't fit that criteria and they're not at their top of their stupid hierarchy, these girls are expendable. You know, this kind of view of, oh, well, English girls, they, they've they got their body out. They're showing their attractiveness. They're almost kind of asking for it, which is so disgusting to even say out loud. But I've heard this and I know it's that mentality. And that's why it's total racism because it's this kind of view of white girls almost, that this is what they are, this is what they're like. And a lot of these victims have come out and said that they would call us white slags. They would say, because you're white, because you're nothing. Race was a huge issue here. In fact, these communities, a lot of them, when they're looking to marry and kind of, they often get kind of arranged marriages, they find it difficult to actually even marry a Pakistani in England, living in England. Even that girl is tainted by living in England. So the preferred source of a wife is to get her straight from Pakistan. So there has become a problem of a first generation in every generation. So I've got a study here from a hospital. So from Bradford Royal Infirmary, 80% of babies of Pakistani ethnicity in the area had at least one parent who was born outside the UK. So these men have this hierarchy understanding, but what makes it even worse is the fact that the social integration of these communities is absolutely terrible. The Pakistani groups in these northern areas have the worst integration amongst any other ethnic group in the UK. Blackburn, Birmingham, Burnley and Bradford have wards with between 70 to 85% Muslims. Another study, in 2013, more than 50% of ethnic minority students were in schools where ethnic minorities were the majority. And that school segregation was highest among students from Pakistani and Bangladeshi ethnic backgrounds. So obviously the segregation as well, it almost allows for these disgusting men to dehumanize these women. They're in their own bubble of Pakistani life, Pakistani culture, they've got Bangladeshis here, you know, 70, 80% Muslims around them. Where they're living, in their schools that they grew up, very community and family orientated. Even the jobs that they, that they get are within their kind of close-knit communities as well. So their bosses are Pakistani, you know, their, co their colleagues are Pakistani. They surround themselves with their community, essentially. Within my Islam, community there definitely was an aspect of you should to a degree separate yourself from non-muslims essentially you be nice to non-muslims you be kind to them you show them the kind of beauty of islam you know if you can bring them to islam you get loads of good deeds for it so that's always a plus but i was always taught at the muslim school i went to that you know your true friends your your close friends should always be muslim oh you who believe do not take the jews and christians as friends they are friends of each other and he who bears affinities to them from amongst you then he is from them. And indeed, Allah does not guide a transgressing people. But I think that's a huge problem that needs to be resolved. And again, I'm gonna say this again, I'm not saying that's the reason why these men did this. What I'm saying is this is, again, another issue that needs to be dealt with because it is fuel to the fire. Muslims need to integrate 
so much more and not have this barrier and culturally these Pakistani groups up north need to find ways to integrate more uh, to diversify their schools I mean to have schools that are majority one race and the minority race just seems a bit strange you're not getting the true picture of the country really this racial segregation mentally and physically makes it so that they don't identify with white people as I said they dehumanize the, these girls almost and, and then and this backdrop of a hierarchy of women definitely doesn't help either. So anyway, these are my thoughts on this situation. I really, really do hope that things change, mentalities change, and stop living in such an ancient understanding of the world. Do make sure to subscribe to my channel. I've got so much more coming. Uh, like this video and let's all support each other and integrate and let's be united against evil acts. Um, anyway, sending you guys so much love and positive energy and I'll see you guys soon. Stay in touch. Mwah.